talk about the next assignment, uh, which sort of deals with um, what you're already familiar with, but with a different methodology and a different subject matter. So your assignment is to create a paper or alternative material sculpture. Uh, you'll be focusing on shape, value, space, and I want you to consider things like cast shadows, depth of field, and perspective, all of which you should have covered in drawing one. It should be, for the most part, a fair, fairly a re, you know, fair review. Um, the sculpture is not permanent, and it should be abstract. And when I say not permanent, I mean disposable. Um, and we'll talk about that in the demo at the end. Uh, I'll want you to draw eight thumbnail uh, sketches in various formats to consider the composition. Uh, I want you to take a photograph after you do that to prove that you did it. Um, I'd like you to set up a station using a light that is reliable to do this. Now here's the thing. Because we're not in here uh, over the course of several class periods, I'll let you work from photography from this one, okay? Because you may not be able to actually control your light source in your uh, respective homes, like your dorm room, et cetera. Um, I'd like you to sketch out a thoughtful and balanced composition from your best thumbnail in light charcoal pencil. I'll show you that in the demo as well. And then I want you to execute the drawing on 18 by 24 uh, paper only in charcoal pencil and vine charcoal. Mostly charcoal pencil, if you can. Work the drawing in a full value range. Add hatching at the end, but please don't rely on line to define the edges. So there shouldn't be any hard line in this whatsoever. The drawing surface must be activated throughout and the entirety of the drawing. And the drawings will be displayed with their respective sculptures. So make sure it's sturdy and storable. Make sure you bring it in when you turn it in. So that's a drawing uh, from drawing two. It's a student drawing of this very assignment, okay? So the whole premise of this is actually uh, what's called trompe l'oeil. And that's how you pronounce that weirdly spelled word there, trompe l'oeil. It's a French term. Uh, it's, a, it's a technique involving generally hyper-realistic imagery in order to create the optical illusion that what you're looking at is in three dimensions. And it's a tradition that goes you know, pretty much back to the Dutch masters. Um, so some examples of trompe l'oeil is a, a very famous one is this tiny little boy um, crawling out of the frame of the painting. Um, it's called escaping criticism. So they're very tongue in cheek. They're very much meditations on still life, um, but also uh, art. So when you do this, I want you to think about texture. Smooth versus rough. I want you to have varied texture. I want you to think about surface quality. Is it shiny? Is it reflective? Is it matte? So if you choose something like an alternative to paper, you're thinking definitely about that. Your lighting needs to be strong and single source preferably, single or two source. And we'll talk about that in the demo. So do not ever use flash photography, ever, when you're working from a photograph. Um, your background and your setting will create cast shadows. So use those as a means to compose, which finally leads to composition. Some materials. You can take a picture of this if you like. Play-Doh, ribbons, bows, plastic wrap, hot glue, paint, whipped cream, whatever. Um, take a picture of it quickly because I'll move pretty qu quickly. I will post this on the Facebook page as well, um, this lecture, so you can always refer back to it. So a friend of mine from grad school essentially does this very assignment. He does very, very large scale reductive drawings. And if you remember, reductive drawings are what? Good. Exactly. You tone the paper entirely with a, uh, your gray vine charcoal, and then you erase into it. Now, you're not only erasing into it, but you're also adding into it in order to create a full value range. And he started to do this in, uh, shortly after grad school. I went to grad school with him um, with uh, black plastic bags. Um, eventually it evolved into these giant compositions of things like cockroaches and bugs that he would find in his studio floor and sweep up. And he zooms in to such a degree that they become these sort of abstract fields. They look like non-objective abstractions. 
So some examples of way, way back, 10 whole years ago, some paper sculptures done in my drawing one class, way, way back. Uh, and an example of a surface study. So both of these are drawings. Uh, this is also an assignment that I do in my painting classes um, as it relates to uh, uh, sort of making sense of three-dimensional space and very much controlling uh, what it is you see, what it is you want to paint, and how you want to compose. This entire premise is based off of the work of a British artist named Neil Gall, and here's one of his drawings. He's primarily known as a painter, though, in which he takes basically trash and he sits at the kitchen table with his very small son, he's no longer small anymore, um, and makes these sort of trash sculptures. Then he photographs them and paints them in a photorealistic approach. So this is indeed an oil painting. When he makes these, sometimes he will actually cut up the photographs that he takes of the setup and then re-collage them, painting then from those. So it's a very meta practice. So sometimes you might see little departures where it seems incongruent with the actual vision of what might be sitting before him, or at least what's going on in the photograph itself. He always does fairly committed drawings of the setups and drawings of the uh, composition before he begins. He thinks exclusively about the balance of contrast and the play of light and cast shadow as a means to make a picture. This particular image is about a very high key value scheme, right? Very little shadow, white on white. He's thinking very much about how he can play with subtlety versus something like this, which is very much about contrast in light with something that still is white on white. So some examples of this very assignment in his work, these are um, colored pencil drawings of paper, little paper sculptures that he's made with, you know, like electrical tape and duct tape and paper. They literally look like, you literally just like cut up paper and slap some tape on it. Right. It's so crazy. And then here's one of his paintings. That's a painting. That's a painting. Wild. How wild is that? So he'll take things like hot glue, he'll take things like duct, white, you know, various colored duct tapes, and he'll leave the sort of mess and the detritus of the subject. So what does this mean conceptually? He's making things that are meant to be disposable, then taking great amounts of time and care to produce a highly crafted, very meticulous object, an artifact that is evidence of his time, of something that is trash, right? It, essentially, I see his work as a meditation on the interplay between um, objecthood and value. You know, many, art, many people in the art world and many consumers of art think that art is only valuable in the time that it's created. The more time it takes to make it, the more valuable it is. That's not necessarily the case. So I think what his work is, is a sort of play with that and negotiates what we see as disposable because in the end, a painting or a drawing, a drawing is just burnt wood on paper and a painting is just mud on a canvas, on some fabric. So it, it really does play with the sort of magical quality of transformation. Some more of his drawings. And they sort of err on the side of cubism after a while. William Dan Daniels does a sort of similar thing in paintings of, uh, of uh, foil, little sculptures he makes out of foil. And they really do play with abstraction. Amy Monick is a friend of mine in New York City who uh, lives entirely off of her work, I believe. She might teach a little bit. Uh, but she makes it, it basically the exact same thing, these sort of garbage still lifes. You see a little setup there in the, in the second photograph. And then she paints from them. She draws from them as well. So you'll begin to recognize certain things like a, two ga you know, a gallon of milk jug container that's been cut up or you know, a plastic Solo cup. And of course, she plays with the still life as well. So she'll throw these homemade objects in with more traditional motifs as well. So, you know, the tea 
the tea kettle obviously is very, very, uh, you know, very identifiable. However, the things in the middle are not. Yep. So this is uh, one of her uh, setups, not a painting. So you begin to see what she's pulling from, spray bottles, you know, garbage. And then a painting. So when you strip the meaning away from uh, at least the traditional motif of the still life, and you choose things that are very, very banal and around you and easily found and not worth value, what then does the image become about? It becomes about design and it becomes about perception, how to make a picture from anything around you. Alexander Ross makes tiny little sculptures out of Fimo. You've all played with Fimo before, that colored clay. Um, and he likes to sort of um, toy with the notion of like the microscopic. He's also pretty much a photorealist. Um, they're painted very, very large. He'll set them against backdrops and then he'll throw them into Photoshop. They're very clearly Photoshopped after he photographs these little things uh, and then put into the cutout tool. Um, and then he'll paint from those, which is a sort of paint by number. So they very much sort of look into the micro versus the macroscopic. And the suggestion of science, the things that we see like, I don't know, a virus. This looks like the coronavirus. And this is done years and years ago. Jeff Koons is sort of the art world uh, postmodern, you know, poster child. Very, very well known, one of the highest selling artists working today. Uh, here is a painting that he uh, did, or his, he and his studio did, wink, wink, of uh, foil and uh, Play-Doh, dealing with the same sorts of things. His work, however, I think is about the shiny detritus, um, very much like how we work, how we as humans, or at least as Americans, operate like canaries. Ooh, color, ooh, shiny, ooh, wealth. So some examples of some uh, actual paper origami sculpture, which, you know, some better than others. But you see that they do play with form. They play with um, planes. They play with negative shape. And you can do a lot with a couple pages of paper. And it really is all about the lighting conditions being favorable to you. Um, if you put something white on white, it obviously cannot be drenched in light. It needs to be a fairly dim light with a spotlight. So I go back to the image that I started with. Uh, granted, the image that I started with is done on toned paper um, with a little bit of heightened uh, value, but for the most part, it's almost exclusively just charcoal. Um, but I think she's playing really, really well with um, the notion of creating a sort of visual landscape, you know, the, the, it's not identifiable, but we see these clouds as represent these shapes identified as clouds, at least symbolically, right? Um, she's cutting out components, creating a sort of negative shape, and she's thinking about the space in which it is interacting. So that is my lecture.